Hey there, everybody. Welcome into Hail Yes, a Detroit Free Press podcast about University of Michigan athletics. I'm Tony Garcia, Michigan writer for the Detroit Free Press, uh, giggling to myself as I'm joined by Reiner Sabin, our Big Ten insider. Uh, th- th- we're starting taping about an hour <laughs> after we were originally scheduled, and he- he's been really going through it um, just with the technology, plugging it in, restarting it, uh, headphones, no headphones, converters, switching outlets. Uh, <laughs> he was about to, quote unquote, put his fist through a laptop. So, <laughs> Reiner, how we doing? Not well. Yeah, not <laughs> good, as they would say. Uh, uh, yeah, it's been really frustrating. I, I hate technology. I, I know. Uh, you know, it just it doesn't seem to seem to work with me. So uh, I'm just going to kind of power through it. You know, uh, like Andrew, our uh, producer here is going to be powering through it. As we talked about, maybe Michael Jordan style from the 98 uh, <laughs> Utah Jazz. I don't, know if it's, I don't know if it's quite flu game level, but uh, definitely came down with a bug and powering through it. So you won't probably hear me as much on the mic today. So, but yeah, it'll be a good show. I'm excited for this one. Yeah, everybody's Man. having issues except Tony. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll try to put it on my back, but, uh, but I really, I need you guys. I rely on you both frequently. And Andrew, you can really hear it in your voice, man. Uh, so let's, we'll try to get the show on the road so you can get back to resting. Last you heard from us, we were in Indianapolis. It was the NFL combine. That was one week ago, almost exactly to the minute. And now it's over. Funny how that works. We are back. And it's time to review. That was sort of a look ahead, what to expect. Now we will look back and touch on a few highlights. It was, for having 18 players there, frankly, it was somewhat mundane, uh, given that not a ton of them participated in the on-field drills, not just Michigan players, players all across the gamut. And then even actually on the last day, we only got to meet with three of the six offensive linemen as Trevor Keegan, Ladarius Henderson, and, and Trent A. Jones were caught up in medicals for literally hours. So eventually, after waiting for a few hours, we just called it. But um, Reiner, any takeaways for for you from what we did see before we get to the, the one man who we will spend the bulk of this episode talking about? Yeah, I, I, there was nothing hugely that I took away from uh, – from the event itself. I mean, I guess, I mean, obviously I think we'll get into it, but you know, JJ McCarthy participating was, I I guess, unusual in the fact that, you know, some of the other top quarterbacks did not participate. And so I think that that was probably the biggest takeaway. And then also the fact that, you know, there was Jim Harbaugh at this event watching some of the uh, Michigan players that he obviously coached and, uh, seeing it from a different perspective as uh, NFL coach and a person who will possibly be selecting these players amongst others that uh, probably competed against these guys too. So he has to evaluate them not and kind of take the personal biases out of it. Right. Stopwatch in hand uh, from the bleachers or from the seats in, at Lucas Oil Stadium. Usually he is on the turf down there. Uh, but it, but it is interesting, right? That's a good point. He'll have to take the the biases out of it. I saw. I can't remember which sports book it was. I saw the odds for Blake Corum on where he gets drafted. It was plus one fifty to the L.A. Chargers. The next closest team, I don't remember which it was, was plus eight fifty. That was pretty uh, remarkable. And I wonder, maybe that'd be like a late third. But I don't. But the Chargers aren't picking late. I don't know. I don't know where that would be. Obviously, there's tons of moving and shifting that that could happen. Uh, but other, I mean, speaking of Blake, uh, 27 reps on the bench. Uh, that's not very surprising. Uh, we saw a video from the fall that was sort of circulating. He did about 30, uh, they said, reps of that 225, although he has slimmed down. He weighed in at 205 this season. He was playing closer to 213, uh, I believe, was his listed weight. And I think he just wanted to uh, to run fast and make sure he was he was moving in agile because everybody knows he can he can plow forward for a yard. He wants to show that that he could shift and uh, mid uh, uh, mid four fives, uh, 40 yard dash fine for Blake and uh, Roman Wilson. Slower, 
40 than expected. He was the one I was, I was off on him. I missed on that. I think last week when we were talking, like, who are we going to be talking about uh, as the most obvious risers? I was like, I can promise you we'll be talking about JJ. I we will also be talking about Mikey Samer still. I think I would have put Roman in that list four four for the forty. D. I mean, is that anything to be concerned with, Reiner? I mean, no, it's still fast, but that's not I Roman. I mean, you look at you know Keon Coleman, the former receiver at Michigan State, is now at Florida State. I mean, he did not run a good forty, but then he did well in the gap gauntlet drill. Uh, uh, was like the fastest guy that Nakua. You know, with the Rams who's, you know, the, the leading receiver as a rookie also didn't run a very impressive 40 and then killed it in the gauntlet drill. And I think those, those things that kind of matter, these more practical football things. I mean, not, yeah. I mean, you're not running straight line 40 usually uh, down the line. I mean, I guess it's when you're breaking away from a receiver, but I mean, I think it's more impressive when you're doing some kind of, football related activity. I think a lot of this stuff is so ridiculous, honestly. I mean, I just remember Calvin Ridley when I was covering his pro day at Alabama, there were there was talk about his poor broad jump at the combine. It's like, when am I ever gonna have to jump in front? You know, I mean that's <laughs> not what I do in the NFL. I don't I don't get off the line and just jump ten feet, you know? I mean it's ridiculous. I mean it, the whole thing is so stupid. Some of the I know that what they're trying to do is it's that, it's that explosiveness. I mean, but come on. I mean, this some of this stuff is so impractical and it just is beyond ridiculous. Some of it, you know, so, and, and throwing on the earth. I mean, I saw Johnny Manziel's pro day down in uh, College Station one year, and I mean, he's throwing, and uh, his quarterback's coach is holding up a broom, and you know, he's you know, it's like this big show, and he's like completed like 48 of 50, but it's under a, like the most ideal circumstances ever. I mean, it had no bear. Did you go to Manziel's pro day? I did. Yeah. It was like, what was that? What was that? I bet that was just a circus. It was a circus because like, uh, George HW Bush, like rolled up with Barbara on the sideline. Cause you know, the, literally rolled yeah, up, I'm sure. Yeah. And there's like Drake music playing and you know, he's going through this quarterback and he's in camo and throwing around i mean it was just it was a total circus and show and it was like you know he looked good i mean throwing you know obviously on air and that's what all these guys do they look fine i might have to dig up what you wrote were you were you selling johnny manzel after that pro day so i think i said like he looked i mean i remember it said he looked good he like he played the part you know well or whatever i can't remember but you know again there was like the, the whole pro day stuff is just a total Total circus, and I mean, again, especially when they're the quarterbacks. I mean, again, they can't simulate what goes on in a real football game. I mean, you know, you're not going to put them under a, a pass rush to tell them to go at it, you know, and and do that. And so, even I even practice. Them. I mean, they've got all this tape. They've got all these analytics that they can evaluate over three, four years, and they have to still do this kind of crazy exercise. I don't get it. I don't get it at all. It's as I think, I mean, we both, it's, it's a made for TV event. It's a, it's as much for, for all the movers and shakers of the league and, and the NCAA. Well, right to be. Also, but it was created before all this, you know, compiling a video that they had. I mean, like every game is. Well, right. That, and that's why they did it then. Because I mean, yeah. not every, I mean, when you were running the combine in the seventies, you can't just pull up unlimited tape on whatever yeah. and break it down from every angle. So yeah. there was a time to. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't have the internet. You didn't have articles that you were readily accessible. I mean, like Jimmy Johnson back in the day would like uh, try to, you know, get the newspapers from out of town to find out what was going on to see, like, you know, for the game plans. I mean, this was back in, you know, when he was, you know, coaching the Cowboys in the early 90s to get like information that would uh, actually affect his team. Like he had to go above and beyond to try to find some stuff you know, to get an edge. Now everything's like, you know, at your fingertips. And so I, I don't know. I, 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 I think this whole thing is a charade. And usually most of the stuff in Indy is really about the medicals. I mean, that's what the, that's probably the most important thing that in the interviews, maybe. Yep. Not wrong. Not wrong. Because I mean, there's plenty of tape. It's, I mean, it's why so many of the guys opted out, right? If, right. if, if running and jumping and putting all these numbers on tape was so important, then everyone, well, I mean, also, I mean the, the the Stroud cognitive test last year ended up making people 
uh, agents advising their clients not to participate in the cognitive test because the NFL can, you know, keep that under wraps. And it's a, uh, and it ended up affecting Stroud as it related to Bryce Young, maybe, you know, whatsoever. But I mean, it got out there and it was embarrassing. And, you know, and then he ends up turning out to be, you know, the best uh, offensive rookie in the NFL this past season. And then they, the NFL looks kind of stupid and, you know, the Panthers the, the, and the agents and the clients are justified for not participating in this cognitive test that may or may not be useful. So, I mean, I, the whole, yeah, I still want my quarterback to be able to answer a lot of basic questions. Right. And maybe, I mean, how much weight you put into it. Sure. However, he scored the test. He scored on the test. And these are pretty basic questions. Like that's still part of being a quarterback. Part of being a quarterback is being the face of the franchise. It's knowing how to act. It's being right, articulate, right. intelligent, personable, and all those things. That's and again, Ryan Fitzpatrick scored like what forty-eight out of fifty on the Wonderland. Harvard, baby. And he went to Harvard, and he was okay. And like, you it, know, does, it doesn't it doesn't mean you're going to be the best quarterback ever. But yeah, it's, I mean, again, you it's you process things quicker. But I mean, it, it that's also not necessarily the case. I mean, who knows? You know, it's a data point. All yeah. these teams are collecting data points, and then you, if this was an exact science, we wouldn't need to do any of this, right? Like it would just be a sure thing. We wouldn't have jobs, and well, that's I, why. I don't think- but the thing is, I don't even think that these necessarily these tests get you any closer to the actual answers uh, that they're trying to that they're trying to find. Because okay. again, they miss out on a ton of prospects every year, and they they get it wrong all the time, even with all this information. Because so you know, what? they're evaluating humans, you know, and humans are you know difficult to assess. Uh, of course, but you need as much data as you can. To make sure. the, your your best assessment, right? Like, just the more data you collect, the more points you have in different ways. There, some are game wraps, some's talking, some is just how fast are you, how athletic are you, some are how you handle pressure in whether that be personable. I mean, face to face interviews, whether that be fourth quarter, two minute drill, gotta have it. And it, you know this. I mean, we. I mean, it's it's all. We're all using all the collective data to try to make the best determination. Sure. And with that, I couldn't see a better jumping off point for what to do with J.J. McCarthy. Uh, that is exactly what we just discussed is exactly what general managers and front office people and scouts and coaches uh, for Almost not all 32 teams because not all of them need them, but for I bet I'd say half a dozen to 10 teams are really, really doing for JJ McCarthy uh, as potentially their next face of the franchise. And he seems to be sort of the it guy in, in as far as polarizing in this draft. So, Reiner, as two people who have seen every single snap he's taken at the collegiate level. I feel somewhat like we're allowed to talk about this with some level of authority. Yes? I mean, I, would agree. I mean, probably more so than a lot of these draft nicks who pop in at the uh, last minute and, you know, start dissecting his throws and then uh, highlights and assume that, you know, they're just getting the full story just by watching, you know, a couple of clips here and there. And again, like you just said before this, it doesn't mean we're going to be right. It's it's actually not even our job. We are not. We are not. We are not uh, analysts. Um, we are not. We are not draft experts. We are not scouts. However, it is our job to talk about the Michigan football program and to talk about everyone around it. And as far as we can tell, make our best determinations on what will or won't happen. And so. I like to see this as sort of planting the J.J. McCarthy flag, as difficult as it may be. I mean, he, he is the guy who people are undecided on still to this day, right? And we're, tr- we're trying a difficult exercise. Do you think he's going to pan out or do you not? Now, there are different definitions of panning out. He does not have to be Patrick Mahomes to be a successful quarterback or Tom Brady. Um, there are only a handful of quarterbacks who single-handedly by themselves 
change the landscape of their team. I'd say Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow, and probably Josh Allen. Then there's maybe a second tier list of really athletic guys, really good quarterbacks. The rest of that top 10, maybe Justin Herbert. Uh, Fields is in that mix. Um, Matthew Stafford has the arm, but he's not he's not mobile enough. He he is not a guy who can do it by himself. We saw that in in, in Detroit, right? I don't I don't think I don't know if I would put Fields in that category since Chicago is looking to move. I on. didn't mean Fields. Yeah. I'm sorry. I meant Hurts, not Justin Fields. Okay. Yeah, Goodness, yeah, yeah. Okay. Jalen Hurts, Jalen okay. Hurts. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> um, I was yes, not Justin Fields. Goodness, uh, no, uh, J- Jalen Hurts. Um, and so we're not saying. If if you are on the side of JJ McCarthy, yes, I'm. I I would take my chance with him. It does it does not mean he has to be Patrick Mahomes, but what it does mean is he's at least Jared Goff, Kirk Cousins, someone who you can win with, someone who is not the pro. Like you can build a team around them. He is not going to be. He's not your limiting factor, right? There are there I there are quarterbacks. I see Baker Mayfield. It, his ceiling is not there. He he cannot do it. Um, who else? I mean, you got. I mean, Kenny Pickett. Like, give me a break, right? Uh, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not for the Panthers. Who 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 they? Uh, Bryce Young, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Jimmy Garoppolo. Although he's close, even he's close. Uh, so above that, right? So I'm ju- I'm just trying to give a range. Like, if you're saying if you're in on JJ McCarthy right now, it does not mean he's going to win five Super Bowls. So I just wanted to to put that out there. Um, so. Are you in on JJ McCarthy, Reiner? Uh, I mean, I, I'm in in the sense that uh, I mean, I think he could be a serviceable, serviceable starter. I don't know again if he can totally lift a franchise. And there's, you know, part of me that wonders if, you know, I mean, if he got put in a bad situation, like say Daniel Jones with the Giants, he can end up like a Daniel Jones. I mean, Daniel Jones has some of the similar characteristics that JJ McCarthy does. Somewhat mobile, you know, has a pretty pretty good arm uh, and look at him. I mean, he's so much a product of the situation. So I think a lot of these guys, I mean, look at Bryce Young. I mean, Bryce Young was considerably, you know, much better prospect than JJ McCarthy. And he, he didn't look too hot his you know, rookie year. And that was all about the situation. So, I mean, his benefit might be, you know, again, getting drafted by a team that uh, is picking on the lower end of the first round, maybe in, Maybe being the you know fourth or fifth quarterback taken as opposed to being the top kind of guy because if you're the top guy you're probably going to a bad team with a bad situation where they're going to be pinning their hopes on you. I mean, look at Justin Fields. I mean, you know, there's some talent there. Uh, you know, again, he was considered a more talented player, maybe a, a better future NFL prospect than JJ McCarthy, and he he didn't end up being. Uh, uh, you know, that great in Chicago. I mean, you know, he's only had a few games where he's thrown over 300 yards and, uh, you know, basically has to rely mostly on his legs. Uh, and that's partially, I think, because they don't have a lot of weapons, you know, for him. So, um, you know, again, also his, you know, accuracy has been dodgy. I mean, I don't know how JJ McCarthy's accuracy is going to translate to the NFL level. Uh, I mean, he looked pretty darn good this year. I mean, 72% completion percentage and a very, very good touchdown to interception ratio that is promising and kind of allays a little bit of concerns as far as uh, his recklessness is concerned. Um, you know, and I, I think, you know, he'll be even more conscious to probably protect the football at the NFL level just because people are kind of aware of the narrative around McCarthy as far as being somewhat reckless and, you know, uh, from that standpoint. So I can see him playing more cautious at the NFL level. Well, he's going to have to, there's no, there's no two ways around it. Uh, he will absolutely have to rein it in um, because in, in this exercise and sort of comparing really the top four quarterbacks, I know a lot of people are putting Bo Nix in that category as the, as the other four as Caleb Williams and Drake may and Jaden Daniels and JJ McCarthy. I'm not. Like for me, he is five. He is number five. He he kind of beat uh, and got and uh, got rid of his away game bugaboos. I mean, his, the first four or five years of his like fifteen year career. I mean, he was he was terrible uh, in away games. And what is he twenty five? Right? Like I'm just 
I, I, I don't know uh, about about Bo Nix. But that's also a possibly situation. I mean, again, he's playing at Auburn, goes to Oregon, totally has a different uh, career. I mean, you know, or his career is totally reformed in right. Oregon versus what it was at Auburn. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, and look at the away games he's playing right yeah, now, Pac 12 versus, versus the SEC. Yeah, You're right. Yeah. No, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, careers are 50, it's 50 50. I would almost say it is it is as much it's like nature versus nurture, right? It's like your environment and your your talent. Yeah. But but here but here's the stat, Reiner, that just blew my mind that makes me think JJ McCarthy has to rein it in if he is going to succeed. Uh, there's just a stat called throwaways. How many times did you intentionally throw the ball away th- uh, this season? Caleb Williams twenty four times, Drake May twenty one times. J.J. McCarthy, one time. See, one. I don't know about that because, I mean, there's a couple of throws that I don't think – that was PFF, I assume. That that, uh, that is per PFF. And, yeah, and there was those, those throwaways – There was a throwaway that he got intercepted against Bowling That's Green. not a true throwaway. It got picked. Yeah. But, I mean, but it was intended to be a throwaway. And then number two is the first he, pass. See, I'm, 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 I'm calling JJ out on that. I'm, call, I'm calling BS. Th- those were not intended to be throwaways. The first pass he, against he, Rose, in the Rose Bowl, I mean, again, that was intercepted. and But it was – On the, 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 the side. It was the exact yeah. same thing. He said it. He said after that Bowling Green game, if I'm throwing it away, he said I got to throw it to the 300 level. That's not throwing it away. That's no, but I mean, I think he, he, think, but, he still uh, thinks that his receiver can make a play. It's like, yeah, I'm throwing it away, but oh, like if you can tiptoe this sideline, no, the defender just tiptoed that sideline and you just got picked. That's what he has to get out of his game. That's a good point, but I, I, I still think that the intent was to throw the ball away, and I don't know if he's always uh, it, uh, being held. You know, I mean, those numbers that are stats are, are you know, exact, exactly correlate with what his intentions were. And the actual number of passes that were intended to be throwaway. So I think, you know, there, but regardless of that, I mean, yes, I mean, he probably needs to give up on some plays more than he does because, I mean, not only that, but sometimes he'll, he'll get in situations where he takes a sack, uh, although that's rarer than, uh, than most, most quarterbacks uh, that also probably try to do the same thing because he has the capability to get out of most of those situations, but sometimes, you know, he doesn't. And so he'll take a sack that uh, you don't want. And that's more likely to happen, obviously, in the NFL when you got, you know, guys running four, four, eight, four, five at, you know, edge rusher type positions uh, across the board in the NFL. I mean, Chop Robinson. Uh, Chop Robinson, yeah. yeah, Chop Robinson is going to be in the NFL. uh, You know, there's probably 15 Chop Robinsons, you know, that can run at that level. Uh, and chase you down. Yeah, no, you're right. But to to get back to that to that escapability point, uh, I think it is also one of the reasons it does sort of play hand in hand with not throwing the ball away because he is just able. He is so good at extending plays and 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 avoiding the sack. So here are some more numbers per Pro Football Focus, uh, and this is a uh, based on a percentage of pressures that are turned into sacks. Right. So how many times are pressured? Are you pressured? How many times are you sacked? Not that. Oh, of course, Caleb Williams is going to be sacked more because he dropped back twice as much as JJ McCarthy. Right. These are percentages of 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 times they were under pressure. JJ McCarthy was sacked. 10.8% of the time when he was legitimately pressured. So nine times out of 10, he got away, right? Caleb Williams was sacked 23.8, Jaden Daniels 20.2, and Drake May 19.5. So all of them were sacked twice as frequently as JJ. Um, and that's not nothing. That's that's part of that. That's part of the, one of the, the Patrick Mahomes thing. Like he's not, he's not fast, like super fast. He's not, Super strong. He's just slippery. And JJ yeah. McCarthy is pretty slippery. Right. No, he is slippery. And uh, but again, I, I don't know how much that translates to the NFL and again the, the speed is just amplified to a pretty high level across the board, especially on the uh, defensive front point. And then also again a lot of the pressure is coming up the middle too, uh, before you can even uh, get to that level. And so it's, it's about getting the ball out quickly. And I think he can do that actually pretty well. So, 
Uh, and uh, I, I don't think that that's going to be concerned. Um, you know, I think there's, there's just going to be a lot of questions about his decision making too. Cause I mean, again, there was that throw across the middle late in the Ohio state game that, again, would probably get picked off. There's also even a throw that led to the touchdown with Roman Wilson, where, I mean, he could say that the safety, he knew from watching film. The, line, was, the linebacker, yeah. The, yeah, the linebacker's line, back was not turned yet. Yeah. Right, and that that's just, that's not happening. I mean, that's going to be picked in the NFL. I mean, and so there's, there's some choices that he makes that uh, from a throw standpoint are very risky. And he does do the throwing back across the field stuff uh, more than you would want, probably from uh, a top level quarterback. So he's got to get that out of his out of his game and shake that out. He does, but but be, it's because of stats. Like, and maybe it, it's what is deemed a throwaway versus not is a little arbitrary. Let's say he had five, right? Let's quadruple it. Um, the fact of the matter is, JJ is not clearly throwing the ball away and giving up on plays at the same rate as others. And so if you can beat it into him, really coach. I mean, remember JJ just turned 21, right? So he's young. He's younger. He's way younger than Jane Daniels. He's younger than, than Bo Nix. Um, if you can just slow him down a little bit, he, he's always doing the meditation. He's always slowing down. Just, I'm not sure what it is. It's you can't all the way take it away. Obviously, because JJ is going to JJ and run around, but just a little bit of throwaway. If he gets just a little bit, because th- you're not asking him to learn to run faster or learn to have a stronger arm, right? He's throwing that the rock 61 miles an hour uh, in in that in that uh, flat footed throw, right? He's uh, he he had a really good day throwing the ball uh, when when he when he was on the field, sort of rolling rolling a little bit. Um, we, I mean, we've seen he can make the the hash mark to the to the far boundary throws. He can catch crazy balls on reverses to him, and then regain his balance and throw it downfield to Roman. Like he has a ton of athleticism, and now uh, evidently he has the size. Right, weighing in at six two and a half, two hundred and nineteen pounds. If you can just get rid of that, no, no, no. Like if you just get rid of that, I think you got a real a real quarterback in JJ McCarthy, like a real NFL quarterback. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, he wants to be like Joe Burrow. I mean, that's what he said he wanted to be. And so, you know, maybe he can be that kind of level of player. If, uh, uh, he gets some of the other stuff out of his, uh, out of his system and the way that he, uh, operates. But, you know, I think, you know, part of what, you know, makes him who he is, is the risk taking ability. And so, and I don't know if that's going to be totally taken out of his game because it might affect how he approaches everything else too. And, you know, may screw him up in a different way. So, I mean, it's, it's tough because that's part of his identity is kind of the uh, riverboat gambler aspect. Right. Well, it's, it's what they did with Patrick Mahomes. And again, he's not Patrick Mahomes, but didn't it feel like last year, I mean, of course they're coming off back to back Super Bowls, but even in the midst of that, it felt like Patrick Mahomes, just got too reckless for a little bit of time, right? And then he just sort of started dialing it back. Like he he's going like this. And so you're never going to ask someone to pull it away all the way, but just it's it's always constantly uh, a give and take. And one more number that I had, Reiner, when thinking about JJ, because so much of the knock on him is what has he done, right? Because of how insulated he was with the running game, with the defense, was he really asked to do anything just just looking at deep balls he they certainly are not the best of the big four but they're right in the middle they're right on par with with uh, caleb williams with drake may all right a little bit of technical difficulty but reiner we were talking about just jj mccarthy and his deep shots compared to some of the other quarterbacks in this draft and I'm just going to run through the numbers one more time because I'm not sure <laughs> what, what worked and what didn't, right? Uh, but J.J. McCarthy has completed 54% of his deep shots, whereas Caleb Williams, 51%, Drake May, 47%. Now, Jaden Daniels was by far the best deep ball thrower this year. Uh, 35 of 55, 22 touchdowns, no picks, uh, 63% of his passes. So he's not just a runner, obviously. Jaden Daniels is, is, is the real deal. 
I don't know that I don't like Jaden Daniels the most in this class. I don't, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to get on that change. I'm just, ah, uh, do you, should we, should we talk about one of the other quarterbacks a little bit? I don't know why I just did that in the middle of this, but I mean, what, what do you think? Are you, are you just super sold on Caleb Williams? One, one can't miss no matter no. what. Uh, no. Let me get, let me give some of my franchise equity to him and his, and his dad, who's his agent. I'm not. I'm not going. To, I, I I haven't watched enough of these guys. I mean, the only one I've watched probably the most is Caleb Williams, and honestly, I don't think he's that great. But I mean, like from what I've seen, I don't. I don't get the. I don't get the hype about him, and also don't love the attitude. Uh, and I don't really like the results from USC based on what's happened the last couple of years. It doesn't seem like he's made them appreciably better. Uh, you know, and I. You know, there are other quarterbacks that Lincoln Riley coached that produced, I think, better results and not only from a team perspective. So, I mean, Virginia McCarthy has got the leg up on all of them from a winning standpoint. I mean, he did what he was asked to do. And, uh, I mean, he went 27-1 and as a starter. Uh, and, you know, he, he mentioned that, that he's not about the stats. And, you know, if it is about winning, I mean, and – in, in a league that is playing a lot of shell coverage where he's not going to be maybe try, you know, they want to take the top off the defense, but it's very hard to, and he has to be somewhat uh, diligent with the idea or, you know, pretty stubborn with the idea of kind of keeping the ball maybe uh, in the short and intermediate range, uh, then maybe, you know, JJ McCarthy is good for that kind of, uh, you know, against those kind of defenses in that sense, because he's done that with uh, with Michigan. I mean, he's played within the boundaries of of the system, hasn't tried to do too much and try to force the issue generally. I mean, again, he sometimes takes, takes risks, but he generally played within the confines of Michigan's offense. Almost, almost, I mean, to a fault, right? Like the, re- the reason there are not to a fault, actually, because they won a national championship, but almost uh, individually, because now people are questioning if J.J. McCarthy <laughs> is capable, right? Like, like he did it. He so much didn't need to just go freelance by himself. He, the question is, how insulated was he? And it's, it's, it's the other end of that coin. But I guess this is a fun exercise, at least for me, Reiner, because, I mean, for a month plus, I just keep getting messages. And really, and really one of the kickoff points for the decision to make this the direction of this episode was our wonderful Lions beat writer, Dave Burkett, just released uh, his mock draft 2.0. You can check that out on Freep.com. And I won't say where he has J.J. McCarthy going, but it's in the top. I'll give a range. Top. It's top dozen. It's top dozen. So it's it's not low. Um and then I get a text, I'll just say, from, from of course, Carlos Menares asking if, if I'm going to write the counter that the JJ is not even a first round pick because, of course, that's what Carlos would do. Uh, and no, that's not what I'm writing because I think he is a first round pick. But it really got me thinking about planting the flag. And that's why we had this this wonderful episode that we had, Reiner, because I've, I've wanted to go to shy away from JJ because there are the question marks. It's, it's just, I mean, I didn't know he's going to put on 20 pounds. Right. And I just thought if he was going to, he was going to weigh in at 195 or 198. I was just really concerned about how that would hold up long-term. And then the more I thought about the, the bad throws, I, th- I think you can get rid of them. Uh, that's not a reason to talk off someone and you can talk your, what really did it. You can talk yourself out of anyone. It's, I mean, if you want to look at the reasons to not draft someone, I mean, you can you could go through the gamut easily with every single quarterback in the in this uh, in this class, right? But here's what I do know about JJ McCarthy, I, and could this be biased from just access, right? And just he's the quarterback we covered, of course. But I'm trying not to because my job is to just I, mean, I don't want to say guess, but project what I think is going to happen. Uh, and I think JJ McCarthy is going to be a very successful NFL quarterback because as a human, he is rock effing solid, uh, like legitimately. And that's not always the case. I have gotten to know other Big Ten quarterbacks uh, who, who 
I mean, I mean, from, from other school, right? I, I mean, I don't even want to. I don't even want to name drop him because because there's no point. Um, I think I know who you're referring to. <laughs> yes, right. Uh, about a decade ago, for another school, played at, for uh, another school who did a lot. Who did a lot of winning. School at East Lansing. Yeah. Yes. 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 Went to school in East yeah. Lansing, and he and he yeah. did a, he did a whole lot of winning there too. Yeah. Uh, not the I, I I sat with him at graduation. Um, just for what it's worth, yeah. not. Not the same. This is this is yeah. not that. And so and so I'm saying it's not just about results. It's not oh look he won. It's not just that easy. And it's not just oh he has a big arm because that guy had a pretty big arm too. It's a lot of intangible. You just you know what you're gonna get. He is going to do if he if he fails. That's who I can go down with. That's who I can be, be wrong about. You know what I mean? There's you're, we're all gonna be wrong. Every and if you're not, then you never said anything to begin with. <laughs> uh, everyone will be wrong at some point. And now, if you're wrong as an NFL GM, you might lose your job. So it's easier for me to be wrong, but I am going to be wrong betting on JJ McCarthy if I am. Well, I mean, uh, you know, it's uh, it's an interesting, you know, discussion in the sense that I mean, again, even for people who have watched him uh, for you know two, three years or whatever. Uh, it's it's hard to assess how he'll do at the next level because again, there's all these other factors that you have to you know consider with his his game in relation to the type of offense Michigan ran versus the situation he could end up in uh, at the pro level. I mean, it's there's a lot of different variables uh, that could influence how well he does. Uh, at the next level and based on what he did here. I mean, again, it's it's hard to hard to know because, you know, again, there wasn't a huge sample size compared to the other quarterbacks as far as, you know, the amount of throws that he he made and, you know, the kind of the consistency in uh, what he was asked to do. Uh, I mean, he's not throwing it 30 times a game every week. I mean, there's some weeks he's throwing it 35 times. There's other weeks he's throwing it 12, you know, <laughs> or 14. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's like it's it's not you don't know. I mean, it just it depends on uh, a lot of different factors. And so I don't. I mean, I don't know how as an NFL evaluator you really assess JJ McCarthy because again, yeah, there's there's a lot of things that you can really uh, get twisted about uh, as it relates to him. It's true. It's it's <laughs> it is one of the toughest exercises, uh, and it's it's why fr- some franchises are so good. Why some just can't get it right. There's nothing more difficult in the NFL than projecting who is going to translate uh, to to that next level. And there's no position quite like the starting quarterback. So Reiner, I think that's a good place to uh, put a pin in this with one final thought. Do you have? An, uh, I know we, we talked about this before. Do you have an ideal landing spot? I think I, if I could just drop JJ somewhere, I think I have a spot where I'd want to do that. I, th- I think, you know, Atlanta probably would be good. I mean, they've got a lot of, a lot of skill weapons and uh, it seems like a team that's probably ready made. And then they have a, a defensive coach uh, who uh, yeah, will probably get the defense right. And so Raheem Morris. And so, uh, I don't know. I think maybe that that situation would be pretty good. Plus, it's in a dome, so uh, you're going to have uh, ideal conditions for uh, half your games or more than half, and if, depending on how many home games you have versus road games. And the uh, odd number of games now in the NFL is 17 versus 16. But uh, yeah, I mean, in general, I think yeah, I, I think you know a place that uh, already has some kind of uh, pretty decent skill positions, uh, and uh, or you know skill talent around them. I mean, I think would be good, and I think Atlanta would be kind of that kind of place. Yeah, no, that would obviously help his game, and I think that that's been uh, more and more common, like Link. However, I think people are thinking that Justin Fields, who when I was trying to say Jalen Hurts earlier, I said Justin Fields, and people are going to think I actually think Justin Fields is top six quarterback. That's terrible. Um, but I think a lot of people are thinking Fields might go back home, right? So there's, but what remains to be seen. If I could pick one spot, 
it would be Pittsburgh. Uh, just to talk about winning, talk about in, talk about just a place where you are going to be well surrounded. You are going to be given every opportunity to win. Uh, Kenny Pickett is not a, capable of putting a team over the top if you have enough around him. Nor is Mitch Trubisky or Mason Rudolph. But J.J. McCarthy, with a really good defense and an offensive line and a running back who can run the ball, he can he can he can move the ball. He he can do some things. And so, and you know you're gonna like <laughs> you know you're gonna win. Uh, it's not you're not going to Atlanta. J.J. McCarthy on Atlanta next year. I mean, what are they six and eleven, five and twelve? Uh, that's I mean that would be tough. JJ McCarthy, JJ, JJ McCarthy on the Steelers. Mm-hmm. I mean they might you could you can mess around and make a wild card. Uh, so yeah. that's just my thought. Yes, yeah, you uh, see that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I can see that. But I mean, the divisions are uh, also. I mean, it depends on what division you walk into too. I mean, like yeah. the NFC South is a lot easier to win than the uh, AFC North. AFC North, I mean, that's true. Yeah. And, and Pittsburgh is is drafting 20 right now. So they'd have to, I mean, maybe throw in like a four or like a, like, I mean, depending on where, like maybe a third to, to scoot up, to move up eight, eight picks or so. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Just a thought, just a yeah. thought, but we will speak to JJ McCarthy. Is that two weeks from Friday, March 22nd is Michigan's pro day in Schembechler hall. The 18 combine representatives plus I think Caden Colsar. Quentin Johnson, my for James Turner. So <laughs> maybe 21 player, maybe a couple, couple dozen. Yeah, and maybe they'll be, I, uh, they'll be trying out quite a bit of players. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, yes. I just hope, do you remember last year after, so after they're done, they come on the other side of the doors and all where all of us reporters are waiting. I just hope we don't do 21 interviews in a row. I mean, for they're like 10, 15 minutes. We'll be there for, for four or five hours. Yeah. Um, but We'll see. Uh, I don't think so. But spring practice starts uh, that that same week, uh, uh, 18th, I think, I believe. And then uh, their spring game is uh, April 20th. Five weeks. Which I, assume, which I assume will be a big place for a Michigan reunion uh, because it's a lead into the draft. Uh, I think that will act as a lead into the draft. I mean, I assume most of the players will come back and then they'll probably stay and they'll probably have some even event. Uh, as it relates to Michigan, I mean, that's my assumption. I have no idea if that's going to happen, but it would just make sense for them to come back for the spring game and then stay for the draft in Detroit and have some kind of local uh, event where, you know, all those guys get together. I, I, I could see it. I could see it. I just, I wonder because there's so, I mean, 18 got like, because there's so many, you'd want to get them all together, but but I also yeah, think like, they're, 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 a lot of them are day three guys, you know, and like well, so a lot of them will be told. smart to have a national championship celebration with the spring because I mean they're not going to be able to get all these guys together in the fall. So yeah, if, if to use the spring game as a as a place to have another kind of like you know, oh to to get all together there, I just meant yeah. the extended like you'd have to get hotel like just so many guys are from elsewhere. I just wonder if they don't like JJ. I expect to stick around. Because I I'm guessing he may be at the draft as a top fifteen pick, uh, yeah. and with it with it being close as well, but no one else is going night one. I don't know, but we'll I think I, mean, I think I think you'll see like the big names like Corum and Sandra Still and, and, and Chris like, Jenkins. Yeah, Chris Jenkins sticking around. I mean, I saw a couple of them fly back to Detroit after the combine, which I thought was interesting. Instead of going to like uh, wherever they're training, so some may actually be training here. Too. So, I mean, you know, it just depends on where, where they're actually doing their their training, where, where they're situated. So, yeah, there's, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be in, you know, this period right now is kind of, uh, uh, you'll see the past and the future kind of uh, intersect uh, over the next five weeks or so. Ever so briefly. All right, Reiner. Very good, as always. Um, thanks to you all for listening as well and thanks to our editor-in-chief nicole Irene nichols our executive editor anjanette delgado sports editor kirkland crawford audio engineer robin chan show producer and editor andrew burkle who he's right he was quiet today uh, hope you're feeling all right on the other side of that andrew uh and for reiner i'm tony thanks for listening 
please continue to rate, review, and subscribe to Hail Yes uh, wherever you get your podcasts. We'll talk to you next time.